And now we find out it's a flashback. We find out that it was Dormandi and Capone that hold him up. They end up killing all of Rothstein's guys and stealing the liquor. And that was the first big kind of war scene that we see. That another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody is doing well. It's Mob Movie Monday. Definitely a, a favorite of all my followers. And today we're going to do something again. It's not a movie. It's television. Great series. Boardwalk Empire. Everybody's been asking me about this for months and months and months. And you know when we do these uh, television series, um, you know we, we can't do them all at one time because this was I think several seasons of Boardwalk Empire. So I'm going to do episode one. Going to give you kind of an overview of the entire episode, what was going on in Atlantic City during that time, start of Prohibition, the Roaring Twenties. Very cool time. I love these period pieces. I love the way the people dress. I love the cars. I love everything about them. Terrific scenery in them. We'll get into that. But before we do want to thank everybody again. You know, I think we're up to, you know, almost 520,000 subscribers. We really jumped in the past couple of days, so thank you all for that. The big giveaway ends today, May 3rd, so get your last stuff in. This is it. We're really excited about it. A lot of participants. Big giveaway. You know what first prize is, you know what second prize is, and then we have a lot of third prizes, too. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Once again, we do the giveaways because we really appreciate the fact that you tune into our content. We know you have a lot of choices, so so thank you so much. We want to show our appreciation. Wait till we get to 750 and a million with your help. Going to be big ones. MichaelFrancis.com. Community continues to grow. Our inner circle is really starting to grow. A lot more involvement with me. We're doing Zoom calls. We're doing a lot of stuff that I know people are going to enjoy. Jump on board of that. I know it's going to be beneficial for your life, for your business. A lot of stuff, a lot of content we're putting in there. So that's that. So let's get into Boardwalk Empire. Great series. You know, everything that HBO does, mob related especially, they do great. Started out with, once again, one of my favorite movies, the Gotti movie back in 1996, produced by HBO. And by the way, I have spoken recently to Armand DeSante, and I'm going to be having a sit down with him very, very shortly. Love the guy, brilliant actor. He was terrific in Gotti. We're going to have a lot of good things to talk about. You'll see that upcoming in the next couple of weeks. Chaz Palminteri, he's on tap, a few others that we got, so things are really coming along. I like to do a lot of the mob-related guys, some of the Soprano guys you're going to see, and we're going to have some fun with it, because even though they played characters, you know, a lot of them had some kind of involvement or, you know, been around mob guys, so it's interesting to talk to them about that. Then Sopranos, obviously, groundbreaking series, you know, tremendous series, and now we have Boardwalk Empire. So that's three great shows that HBO produced pertaining to the mob, you know, and, and I love them all, I'm going to be honest with you. So, Boardwalk Empire, set in the 1920s in Atlantic City. And Steve Buscemi is the star. He plays a character by the name of Nookie Thompson, who was a big shot in Atlantic City. We'll get into that. Based upon a real-life character, Nookie Johnson. But let me kind of lay out what Atlantic City was back then. It was January of 1920 that the Volstead Act, Prohibition, came into play, and alcohol was banned. Why was it banned? Really for moral reasons. You know, people just thought the women were against it. People thought alcohol was bad. It shouldn't be consumed. And therefore, they created a law against it. Now, I got to tell you this. Everything that may not be good for you doesn't mean that you have to legislate it. Everything that's possibly immoral, possibly, because a lot of people can enjoy alcohol and just enjoy it and it doesn't affect them in any way, shape, or form. For those that have a problem, it's a problem. It doesn't mean that you have to litigate it and make it illegal. You know, when it comes to alcohol, I'm against prohibition. People should be allowed to drink if they want to drink. Got to learn how to control themselves. That's it. Some of you may say, yeah, but you know, drunk drive, I know it's horrible. It's horrible. But like anything, else that's illegal that's illegal and you shouldn't be doing it you know you're not supposed to drive when you're drunk we all know that but people should be allowed and thankfully they are allowed to drink alcohol when they want it and that's it so prohibition comes in in 1920 and in Atlantic City it was boon time for politicians that were extremely corrupt back then maybe you can relate to some of that today you know what we're living through and obviously the mob. And I've said this in past videos that it was prohibition 
that made the mob strong. The government contributed to it because mob guys took advantage of it, made hundreds of millions of dollars, and they became really an organization, a real organization, as a result of the money and the power that they accumulated during the years of prohibition. It was prohibition, it was gambling, those were the two biggest things. Yes, there was some prostitution going on, that wasn't a main revenue stream for the mob, but people were involved in it. The drug business to a degree back then, but uh, it was really prohibition, the illegal sale of alcohol, obviously, and gambling, that really put the mob on the map and made cause an in this country what it is. But they wouldn't have been able to do it that well without the help of many corrupt politicians. So in Atlantic City at that time, in Atlantic City along the boardwalk, that was the happening place. It was beautiful, there was great places to dine and to have alcohol, and you had the boardwalk, you had the beach right there, it was great. And in Atlantic City at that time, when prohibition came in, they didn't really enforce it. Politicians were waiting for it. And here's where Nookie Thompson, I should say, but in real life, Nookie Johnson. And by the way, Steve Buscemi played a great character, but he didn't look anything like the real Nookie Johnson as far as I know. The real Nookie Johnson was six foot, I think it was over 200 pounds, very flashy guy. He used to dress, you know, he used to wear a long cashmere coat. He used to have a flower in his lapel. He lived very large. He lived very high. He was a county controller. He was a tax controller. He was a banker at one time. He did a lot of different things. And he was the politician that eventually controlled Atlantic City. I believe his father was a sheriff at one time. I think he might have been the sheriff one time when his father passed away. But he morphed into this larger than life political character. And they celebrated when prohibition came in because remember they were on the state level, the city level, and it was the feds that created the Volstead Act and Congress that put it into play, made it a law. And there's one scene when Nookie is sitting around the table with all his other politicians and his brother who happens to be in law enforcement, he's a cop, and uh, they're celebrating. There's a big scene in a nightclub when they're celebrating prohibition because they knew that this was boon time for them. They had planned it, they were ready for it, they had their illegal stills that were ready to go into operation, their bootlegging was ready to go. They saw this as boon time for them, they were going to make a tremendous amount of money. And that's really what Boardwalk Empire is all about. It's during the days of Prohibition, they show the relationship between Nookie Thompson, Nookie Johnson, and the mob. And all the mob characters are there. You got Lucky Luciano, you got Big Jim Colissimo, you got Maya Lansky, you got Arnold Rothstein, guys that we've spoken about in the past. They were all there, all involved, and all working hand in hand. And even Al Capone, because you know, Capone started out in New York, New Jersey. He wasn't always in Chicago. He followed Johnny Torrio out to Chicago and became obviously a huge bootlegger out there, the king of Chicago for some time. But all of these guys started in New York, all of them, and New Jersey. I, I almost can considered New Jersey, Atlantic City, like, you know, part of New York. I mean, it's that close by. And I spent a lot of time in Atlantic City. I'm going to be honest with you, never was thrilled about the place. I mean, for me, you know, Vegas is the place to go. It wasn't really in Atlantic City, but back then, it was the place. And so we meet another great character. His name is Jimmy Dormande, and he was kind of Nookie Johnson's protege. He went off to serve in the war in World War I. He comes back and he reconnects with Nick. He plays a great part, by the way. Michael Pitts is his name. He's terrific in it. But anyway, when it opens up, we see Nookie Johnson actually addressing a number of women. It was a big women's organization. They were the ones that really led the charge against alcohol. They wanted the Volstead Act. They claimed it was immoral. And we see Nookie Johnson addressing them. And he tells a story about his father, who was an alcoholic, and how he, as a young child, had to take care of his family because his father was so out of it. And he was really appealing to the women in that scene. And then he walks out to his car with Jimmy Dormandi, his protege, and he says something that is so typical of politicians even today. Because Jimmy Dormandi says, nice story you told there. It really pulled at the heartstrings. But he looks at him, Nookie does, he looks at him and he says, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Now, how many times have you witnessed that with our politicians today? Never let the truth get in the way of a good story. How often do we see our politicians lying to us? pandering to us, telling us things that they have no intention, commitments they're making that they have no intention to keep whatsoever. 
what do they do? They try to appeal to us. They appeal to the crowd. They go whatever way the wind blows. So many politicians are like that, and we see that today. You're going to see that in my book, Mafia Democracy. Yes, it's coming along, almost done. We'll tell you when the release is. Not for a couple of months. I know people are asking me about it already. I don't have it to sign yet, so just relax on that. It was a great scene and such a true statement that he made. So this starts to move along, and we start to see that, again, Nookie Johnson, Nookie Thompson is thrilled that prohibition is actually there. There. This is his chance to make money. He was a very strong presence. And let me tell you, a lot of corrupt politicians during that time in the 1920s. And the reason they call it the Roaring Twenties is because prohibition made people roar. I mean, it's amazing how people want what they can have. You know, you make it illegal, they almost want it more. Now, if you make it legal, that doesn't mean they're going to stop drinking it more. They're not going to stop pursuing it more. But if it's illegal, they want it even more. And you know, I guess it's more exciting when you're able to have it and you're doing something wrong. I don't know. I don't know what the thing is. But anyway, the politicians are all very happy. Like I said, there is a scene when they're all celebrating that. Everybody in the nightclub that they're in at that time is celebrating. They're actually counting down to the time when the Volstead Act actually takes place on January 16th, 1920. So that's how it unfolds. And Atlantic City is going to be a boom town. It's going to be a town for recreation. It's going to be a town for getting alcohol where you can't get it. And everybody's going to be happy. And by the way, I don't know if many of you know this, but Atlantic City back in the 1920s, there was a very big African-American population. After the Civil War, a lot of African Americans, they left the South and they come up to Atlantic City. Why? Because there were a lot of restaurants, bars, there was work opportunity there. And I think at the time there were about 10,000 African Americans living on the north side of Atlantic City. And unfortunately it was segregated so they had to basically keep to themselves. But, you know, it was a good atmosphere for them in many ways because they were free now. They were able to go out to the beach. I think they called the beach Chicken Bone Beach that they all settled in only because, you know, African Americans like myself, we like chicken, you know, so they used a lot of chicken and for some reason they called it Chicken Bone Beach, but they had their own security there. There was a lot of African Americans at that time in Atlantic City that, and they got there to work. As we move along, we see a scene where now the feds, because remember the feds are in charge of enforcing prohibition, not so much the state and the locals, it was the feds. So we see the feds are training agents now. They're getting them ready because they know there's going to be an enforcement issue. They create a new agency for that. And the feds are getting ready. We are introduced to Michael Shannon. Uh, you know him. He played Kuklinski in a film that I already reviewed, The Iceman. Well, he's an agent at this point in time. And you know, funny thing is almost everybody in this film is corrupted. Everybody. They all, one way, shape, or form, want to get involved in making the money that Prohibition is offering them. But that comes later on. Again, we're only in episode one. We find out that Nookie is a big womanizer. He's with a different women, and allegedly his first wife died of consumption of alcohol. So that's why he was appealing to the women that alcohol should be banned, when his real motive is, it should be banned so I can make money, and the rest of us, so the town can boom. We see an interesting scene there when Nookie is going into a funeral parlor, and we see somebody laid to rest there. And then he goes into a back room of the funeral parlor. He wasn't really there to pay his respects to a dead person. He was there for another reason. And he meets a guy and they open up a secret sliding door and there's the still where they're creating and making the alcohol. Nookie is obviously part of this. Jimmy Domondi is with him. They're explaining how they're making the alcohol. It's really garbage stuff. It's not good stuff. And they give Domondi a taste of it. And as he's tasting it, the wise guy says to him, you know, there's formaldehyde in this. Domondi spits it out and then goes after. He wants to attack the guy that gave it to him. Formaldehyde obviously is used when you're embalming someone. So it was a good scene. It just fit in well. And as we move along, we find out that Jimmy is a troubled guy. Came back from World War I with some issues. He wants to make money. He wants to be respected by Nookie. Nookie treated him like he was a youngster. As a matter of fact, he was supposed to go to Princeton University. He didn't want to do that. After the war, things changed for him. That happens to people. As we move on, we see a scene where he talks about himself being a murderer. He's a killer now. He's a whole different person after coming back from World War I. I understand that. Another interesting character is introduced. It's a girl by the name of Kelly who's pregnant, who was at the initial meeting where we opened up and we saw Nookie speaking to the women. She comes and sees Nookie and she's talking about her husband who's a problem guy and maybe Nookie can help him out. And you kind of see there was something that might be going on. 
bond might be developing between Nookie and this woman, Kelly. Anyway, Kelly has a troubled relationship with her husband. Nookie drives her home, gives her some money to help her out. As it moves along, we see that she has a very troubled relationship with her husband. Her husband, in one scene, finds the money that she had hidden under the pillow, wants to know where she got it. You can tell that he's abusive. She doesn't want to tell him. In that scene with their other two children sitting at the table, he smacks her around and kind of abuses her. Bad scene, you know. No guy should ever hit a woman. That's my position. I've never struck a woman in my life. I don't tolerate it. I don't stand for it. Obviously, if a woman is attacking you, you defend yourself. But uh, I don't believe in that. And unfortunately, I've witnessed that with other people in my life. And I think it's pathetic. You know, no man should ever strike a woman. And I say that with all sincerity. So that's a tough scene to watch. Then as we move along, we see the feds are doing their investigation. Obviously, they didn't have good surveillance techniques at that time. They used to be standing outside, maybe observing people. And we see a scene where Shannon and is standing out observing a meeting that is about to take place between Nookie Thompson, Big Jim Calissimo, Arnold Rothstein, Lucky Luciano, a bunch of the mob guys. And they're basically all talking. They sit down and they're talking about prohibition and how they're going to get alcohol from Nookie Thompson. And it's a good scene. It shows that their politicians are in bed with the mob from early on. And the feds are outside watching, getting names, seeing who's who. And, but you see how this develops. And, you know, look, I had a relationship with politicians on the street. When I was in the gas business, we had to be licensed wholesalers in order to collect the tax on every gallon of gasoline. Well, it wasn't easy to get the uh, licenses. I had political contacts that I was paying off that helped me get 18 licenses in Albany and actually some licenses also in Florida. They were wholesale licenses. So I understand what it is to be in bed, so to speak, with a politician or for them to be in bed with us. A lot of times we supported their campaigns. We had dinner with them. I'm not going to mention the politicians in New York. I don't think it's appropriate now. But same goes with law enforcement. You know, in New York, a lot of times if we had a gambling operation, you know, we would pay off some of the people to look the other way, some of the cops. Every once in a while, you saw this in movies. Unfortunately, it does happen. Or you'd give up a smaller guy so that well, the cops can make a bust and they'd stay away from you. A lot of that stuff went on. And believe me, with lobbying and things that go on today, things haven't changed that much. Trust me when I tell you that. There's a lot of politicians out there that will do the bidding if it lines their pockets and serves their agenda. And I know that for a fact. And then there's a great scene between Jimmy Dormandi and young Al Capone. And remember, again, Capone came out in New York. And Capone had driven Johnny Torrio to this meeting, you know, that I just described. Capone and Jimmy DeMondi are outside waiting by the car. It's a little cold out, and they start to talk. And, you know, it's a conversation that hit home with me because they're talking about how much money they were making. And they said at the time, Arnold Rothstein was worth millions of dollars. Colesimo was worth millions of dollars. Luciano might have been worth half a million dollars. Tons of money in 1920. You got to understand, that was a lot of money. And they're talking about it. You can see that why they want to be mob guys. And so often today, because they're attracted by the money, the power, the cars, you know, the dress and everything else. And so often today, and actually in the last 20 years, I have spoken to countless young men in several prisons and in youth organizations. And I'll talk to them about the street life is a dead end street. And I try to encourage them to go the other way. A lot of guys are in jail that made mistakes. I tell them, when you get home, you got to straighten out your life. And I tell them the mob life, the street life, criminal activity, it's not where to go. And they will inevitably, somebody will always get up and say, come on, Mike, you made all that money. You had the best cars. You had the nicest women. You know, you had a lot of power. You had a lot of respect. And they'll cite movies like Goodfellas and Godfather and Casino. And they'll say, look at the way those guys lived. And then I always have to remind them, I say, did you watch the end of the movie? How come you only saw the, you know, the cars and the money and the fun and the power? How come you didn't see who went to jail, who got killed, whose life was destroyed, whose family was ruined? They don't see that part because they don't want to know that. They only want to know about the money and the power and everything else. Well, that's the downfall of so many people. They look at that life like everything is so wonderful when in reality it's not. It always ends up bad, most all the time. You know, let me be careful. It almost always ends up bad. In the greater percentage of times, it ends up bad for anybody and everybody that's involved in the street life, whether it's organized crime or you're just a criminal. Either way, especially today, 
When law enforcement has got all the tactics, all the techniques, you're going down. There's so many informants and snitches on the street. You don't have a chance today. You really don't. But this scene, you know, epitomizes what people think. You know, hey, you know, we got the money, the power, and their eyes are wide open, and this is what they want to do. And that scene was very telling. Now there's a scene when Shannon, drug enforcement agent, brings Jimmy Dormandi in for questioning, and they try to flip him. They try to make him an informant against Nookie Thompson. And you know, Shannon delivers a line that I have said to my wife so many times, and she said, where did you get that? What does it mean? And I said, you know, I don't really know what it means, and I had to look it up to find what it means. But Shannon, when he doesn't believe what Jimmy Dormandi is telling him, says, tell it to Sweeney. Now, I've said that to my wife many times because as I'm getting on in years, and during my day, I heard that many, many times. My grandfather would say it, my father would say it, when they believe you're telling them a lie, right? So I looked it up, I said, where did this really come from? Well, there was a movie made, it was a silent film in 1927 that says, Tell It to Sweeney, that was the name of the movie. And I couldn't find anything more about it, I didn't see what the overview was, what the summary of the movie was, that's where that saying came from. So it must have been about somebody telling a lie, whatever. Anyway, it was just interesting to me. Tell It to Sweeney, so remember that line, when you think somebody's putting you on, not telling you the truth, just say, Tell it to Sweeney. And somebody said, what do you mean? Say, look it up, 1927 movie. So anyway, Jimmy is not going along with that. You know, he's not an informant. He wants to be a wise guy, he wants to be a mob guy, he wants to make money. He wants to get involved in the opportunities that Prohibition is providing for him. Next scene is that Dormandi and Al Capone meet at a fight. And there's actually two midgets fighting in the ring. I never saw that before. Anyway, two midgets. Dormandi starts talking to Capone and asks him about a liquor delivery that's coming that night that belonged to Arnold Rothstein. And this is where we see them planning, they're gonna hold up this and they're gonna steal the liquor. And that's what they do. And actually the opening scene of the movie we saw this, it opened up that way, I didn't mention that yet, but we see an illegal cargo of booze coming off a boat and it's gonna be delivered someplace and this belongs to Arnold Rothstein and then they get held up. And now we find out, it's a flashback, we find out that it was Dormandi and Capone that hold him up. They end up killing all of Rothstein's guys and stealing the liquor. And that was the first big kind of war scene that we see that bootlegging brought on. I mean, you know this, you're familiar with this. A lot of wars went over prohibition among mob guys, street guys, even cops got involved in that. So anyway, Nookie Thompson finds out. He has a conversation with uh, Dormandi about it. He finds out that it was him and Capone that actually did this. A lot of trouble as the media gets involved, the drug enforcement agency gets involved. This is kind of the first big thing that happens in Atlantic City, the first big problem over prohibition that we see. And Nookie Thompson is actually mad at Dormandi for doing this, but Dormandi says, hey, you know what? You can't be half a gangster. He tells Nookie that. He says, you can't be half a gangster. You gotta be all in, that's it. And it was a good scene, the dialogue between the two of them where Demondi tells him, this is the route I'm going. And you're half a gangster right now. You gotta be in it all the way. Basically, that's what he tells him. And then as we get near the end of this episode one, we see a couple of killings go down. Calissimo gets killed. And we see the husband of Kelly, the pregnant woman that got abused by him. He gets picked up by Nookie's brother who's a cop, and they beat him up, and then they kill him. They find him, he's sleeping with the fishes. They pull him out of the water, and he's sleeping with the fishes. So we see that go down, and it ends with Nookie going to the hospital, seeing Kelly, and you can tell that the love affair is gonna start between the two of them. So that's basically how this episode one ends. And you know, I can't get into all of the episodes, and I'm gonna jump around. We're gonna do a couple. We're gonna do some more of The Sopranos. We're gonna do some more of The Making of the Mob, and we're gonna do some more of Boardwalk Empire. But I'm gonna pick out the episodes that I think are really hot, that uh, we really should be speaking about, uh, that really uh, you know appealed to me, and then we'll take it from there. So that's it for today. Remember, this is it, last day of the giveaway. So if you haven't got into it, get into it now. You got another 12 hours. MichaelFrancis.com, we hope you jump aboard. So how do I always leave you? Be safe, be healthy, God bless, and yes, I will see you next time.